In today's economy, more people than ever are looking to buy and sell businesses. But how do you do it? Welcome to The Deal Board, presented by Transworld Business Advisors. Straight talk about real deals and real people. Listen to stories, interviews, and expert advice to help your business sale, merger, or acquisition process. Now, here are your business exit experts, Andy and Jessica. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Deal Board. And we have a great episode for you today. Because we've seen the statistics out there on our podcasts in the past, and we see that valuation is a very popular subject. Right, Jessica? Yeah, it's it's one of our top um, podcast episodes and has consistently stayed in the top, even though I think it was like episode two and three that we did. So today we're going to do a deeper dive into valuation. Um, and specifically, we're going to talk about some mistakes that we see people make when they're valuing their business or trying to value their business on their own. Yeah. And we've seen a ton of mistakes over the years that people make, even CPAs. It's crazy. And I just sat down with a valuation expert who just did a valuation that did a ridiculous job. It's not even one of our 10 reasons, but this person did a projection out into the future where the business was growing by 10, 15%. And all of a sudden, magically, the business, instead of having a 5% bottom line to gross, uh, it had a 15% uh, to gross. And it was like, it, it had no basis in reality. Business had made an average of $200,000 and they valued the business at $7 million. Wow. And that's not even in our top it's not 10 even mistakes. In our top that's, 10. Yeah. But that, I mean, we talk about that on the valuation episode that buyers pay for past performance of the business. They're not going to pay for future projections, especially not if they're out of line of what's happened in the past, like you're talking about. Yeah. And we also have a great interview with uh, Paul Corrigan from Trans World Business Advisors of the North Shore, Boston area. Uh, he also is a business valuation uh, expert and he gave us some of his thoughts to valuation, uh, which is great. But, I, you know, again, I think this stuff that we're about to talk about is really kind of 101, what we see out there in the world and what we know are mistakes. And I can't believe that professionals make these mistakes often, often. Right. Often. So if you're sitting in a seller's shoes, you want to check the valuation, even if you have a professional do it and make sure you're avoiding these mistakes. Look, if they don't come up right away with the buyer, they will in due diligence and the deal will either die or get retraded. Um, and if you're a buyer looking at businesses for sale, these are just some areas that you want to check the valuation that was produced for the business that you're looking to acquire. Agreed. Agreed. So let's do number one. And it's one of my pet peeves. So, so no, <laughs> yeah, number one is that they add back distributions. Uh, so businesses uh, over a year's time have a P&L statement. It has gross minus, minus the, uh, the cost of goods sold, uh, gross margin, and then you minus out the expenses. And then you have a net profit. And we do a, we, we do, uh, a, a recast on that net profit. And many times what business owners do if they're making money they also write themselves checks or take money out of the bank in the form of distributions that is not on the expense sheet. They just take money out of the out of the proverbial cash register that is filled with, with uh, money, their bank account, and they take it out. And what they try to do is then take that money that they wrote checks for and bring it back and add it back again, which is incorrect. Right. It's basically, you know, you're taking your distributions from the profit. So we're already, we're using that profit to generate what the cash flow number is or the seller's discretionary earnings, SDE, if we're going back to the valuation episode. So if you're adding back distributions on top of that, you're double counting that profit basically. Right. And, and there could be reasons that they brought money to begin with. I do a, a small little exercise and I'll try to uh, drill this down, but I do a small little exercise with my daughter, opening a lemonade stand and I give her a hundred dollars at the beginning of the day and they make a hundred dollars. So then they have $200,000 in their little cash register at the end of the day. And they take that $200 as a distribution and go buy stuff at the mall. So the question is, is did they make $300? Did they make a hundred dollars selling lemonade and take another hundred dollars uh, from the till that I gave them, you know, to start off their little business. No, they didn't make $300. They only made $100. 
Yeah, so we see that one quite often. Um, and actually that one kind of is related to the second um, biggest mistake that we see. And that's adding back salary for a second owner, family members, or additional owners. Um, like we talked about in the initial valuation and recast episodes, when you're doing these add back situations and you're calculating your valuation based on seller's discretionary earnings, you can add back one owner's salary, but not multiple. Right. And sometimes we see that as well. I just uh, looked at the financials of a business that had three brothers in it. And of course, they wanted to add back all three brothers. And I said, well, do all the brothers work? And they're like, yeah. I mean, you know, one of them is in charge of accounting, one's in, one's in charge of the salespeople, and one's in charge of, it was a construction company, one's in charge of project management. And I'm like, well, you'd have to replace all those people with someone else. And that business would not be valued based on adding back all three salaries. And they only wanted 20 million for that business, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, you're going to have to replace those people. Um, so it's not like you're going to find another buyer that has three brothers that are going to do the same roles. And even if so, that's not how valuations are calculated in the business marketplace. So only adding back one owner's salary, and then the other ones need to stay in there. And we'll talk about this too, but sometimes you need to adjust the own, the second owner's or family member salary to reflect a regular living wage. So we see a lot, the family members are making way under what you would have to pay a general manager of a restaurant or something like that. Yeah. And that kind of leads to number three. Number three is not adding back any salaries. So sometimes, uh, you know, like we said, you have to adjust if they're underpaying, but sometimes when we see businesses that are valued uh, and, and they're valuing it, they don't add back any salaries. Or the other mistake is if it's absentee owned, you could actually add back the manager's salary and value that. And if you have multiple uh, locations, each location can be valued as if it were standalone. Now, is the buyer going to have to look at it? And if they're buying all three locations or multiple locations, are they going to have to look at it as a cash flow and how much they make and how they value it? Yes. Uh, but really, if you were truly doing a business valuation uh, for tax purposes or comparative, comparing different locations, you have to value the location as if it was run by a business owner. Right. And I think that brings up, brings us back to like the reason the valuations are done this way is to normalize businesses, right? So then buyers can look at a business in one industry versus the next and the valuation is the same. Um, so this is all like rules of the valuation. If you haven't listened to our original episodes, I think it was number two and three, go back and listen to those. And that talks a lot about like, why do these valuation rules exist? But at the end of the day, you have to put all businesses on a playing field where they can be compared to each other. So, you know, adding back one owner's salary or the manager's salary if it's owner absentee. So let's jump into number four. And Andy, this is another pet peeve of yours, but adding back your credit card bills on top of the expenses that have already been calculated. Yeah, what your accountant does is they'll look at your credit card bill. And if it's a business credit card, let's assume it's a business credit card. Uh, they take the, the expenses on the credit card and put it into certain categories. So they'll put uh, the restaurants into meals. They'll put the travel into travel, t &E. They'll put in uh, the gas into the automobile expense. And what we do as, as, as valuation and business brokers is we're going to add back what we think is discretionary. So we're going to add back perhaps some of the meals. We're going to add back some of the travel. We're going to add back the personal car. We're going to add back the personal cell phones if that's run through the credit card too. And so we add all that back and that's part of SDE. Now what owners and accountants and sometimes accountants want to do is they're like, well, we pay a check every single month to our credit card for $2,000. So that's another $25,000 or so of money that we should just take a number of 25 and throw it on the bottom line. And it's crazy. You can't do that. All right. So that brings us to number four, which is another one of your pet peeves, Andy, but adding back credit card bills after the expenses for the credit card have already been reconciled with, with the accountant. Yeah, what your accountant does is takes your credit card bill and looks at the credit card bill and sees charges for gas and puts that in auto and sees charges for dining or dining out and puts that in meals and sees like travel and puts that in the uh, T&E 
uh, expense file. And, you know, maybe there's cell phones on there and it puts that in telephone. And what we do as business brokers, is we start asking the owner questions like how much of this is personal? Is there a personal car? How much of the travel is personal? How much? And so what we do is then recast those items, the auto, the travel, the meals, the, the, the cell phones in telephone, uh, perhaps some insurances and things like that. And what owners then want to do after we add all that back, say, well, wait a second. I write a check every single uh, month to our credit card bill for, say, $2,500 or so. And that's, you know, another $25,000, $30,000 a year. So we should just take a $25,000 mo- number, stick it on the bottom of the recast plus $25,000 for credit card. And you can't do that. Yeah. Again, it's, it's another version of double counting, right? So you're, you're adding additional expenses back that don't, that have already been added back and some that don't need to be added back. Um, so then related to the double counting too, number five is adding balance sheet items on top of the cash flow valuation that's been calculated. Yeah. There's a lot of this out there and, and, and there are some rules of thumb that, uh, I don't necessarily agree with that say, oh, you should add inventory on top of it. And I could go with maybe excess inventory, but really uh, some people want to say a two-time or three-time multiple on SDE or a four-time or five-time uh, multiple on, on EBITDA. And then on top of that, we, you know, it costs us a million dollars in build out, or we have uh, $3 million worth of equipment, or, you know, they want to take the inventory and throw that on top. No. That's that's mixing and matching valuation approaches and methodologies, and that doesn't work. Yeah, you really either value a business based on its assets or based on its cash flow. And what I tell everybody is that in the cash flow valuation or, or applying a multiple to SDE, really the asset should be generating cash flow. It should be generating profit, um, and that's how you get the value from those assets, not by adding them back on top of the additional valuation. Right. You're already doing that. You're already uh, putting together a valuation based on the earnings of those individual uh, assets. And, and that's a whole nother methodology, but we could talk about that uh, some other time. Yeah. <laughs> but the other, th- the other mistake that people make, the next one is they take that multiple and they apply it to the wrong number. And we've seen this over and over again. They hear, oh, my business is worth four, uh, my business is worth three times. So three times gross or three times gross margin or three times, you know, some magic number that they come up with. And so they take the wrong number and apply the, the pr- maybe a proper multiple, but they, 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 they then take it and, and multiply it by gross. And I just had this yesterday. Somebody thought their business was worth four times gross. I'm like, Oof. no, no. Yeah. And, and look, there are multiples for every number on, on your recast or on your PL. There's a multiple for revenue, but it's usually the lowest number, right? Um, there's a, a multiple for EBITDA. Usually the EBITDA multiples are higher than SDE, but EBITDA doesn't add back an owner's salary. So the number for EBITDA is going to be lower. So you just have to understand if, if you're working with a broker or a valuation expert and they're quoting multiples, based on comps, you have to understand which number that applies to. Um, so, you know, and we've talked about, you know, Andy, what's the average multiple on SDE for small businesses? Two. Two. <laughs> Two times, right? So, yes, yeah, some people are shocked. They're like, well, I've heard it's three or four times. Well, that might be an EBITDA multiple versus an SDE multiple. So you just really need to understand which is the proper number to apply it to. Right. So there's almost two mistakes in that one. There's a mistake of applying the multiple to the wrong number where, you know, you, you hear four times, four times EBITDA, and then you try to multiply gross sales. And then there's the, and then there's applying the wrong multiple. So you're, you know, is is applying four times to the, the, you know, that to the wrong number, you know, they have the, the right, they have the, you know, they have the SDE, but now they're taking an EBITDA multiple. So it goes both ways. Uh, again, you know, of course, sellers are always trying to overestimate what their businesses are worth. So, um, and, you know, again, the marketplace just won't pay. Uh, so, and especially if it goes through due diligence and they have smart people, which everybody's pretty smart when they go to buy a business. So the next one um, we have is adding back expenses um, for failed business 
um, ventures. And I see this a lot in marketing, right? So somebody might try um, a new marketing campaign and fails or doesn't produce the results they want to. And they're like, oh, well, we'll just add that back. Well, every, every business has to try marketing and advertising and not everything's going to work, right? So you'll get a lot of questions that are revolving around due diligence. Like, all right, so we added back all the marketing expenses. Can this business really survive without advertising? And the answer is no, no business can survive without advertising, right? So that's the one you have to be careful of. Um, There are some real one-time hard costs that you can add back, but just because something doesn't work doesn't mean it automatically gets added back. Yeah. And some things are business expenses that people don't think are business expenses. Like they think that uh, donations, uh, you know, ongoing donations are not a business expense. And, you know, I had someone that was their number one customer used to run a golf tournament every year and they were the number one sponsor. I'm like, boy, that sounds like a business expense, you know, but I, you know, understand if there's a one-time donation to something and they'll never do it again and it didn't bring any business to them, maybe that's an, an ad back. And we have seen some people bring on, like we had this uh, big boat engine company that brought on a second boat engine line that was a complete failure that they never launched. And they spent, you know, like $250,000 on inventory and things that they just trashed. So, uh, and and brochures, that probably could be added back because again, it was an anomaly. You know, they're making a certain amount of money every year and that, and it dipped one year because of that. That can work, but trying to add back expenses or over adding back expenses um, just puts a, a it, it creates inconsistencies, it creates mistrust. And if you overdo the add backs, uh, that's not gonna be good for your valuation. Yeah, so what's the next one, Andy? The next one is uh, playing the revenue and earnings games of good years. And we see this a lot, you know, so if somebody's like trending down, uh, which we've seen uh, like before the economic downturn, people were trending up. And then all of a sudden during the economic downturn, they're trending down. They're trying to do a three-year average, taking their best year ever and dragging it into this three-year average. And I've seen, you know, private equity groups do the same thing as a business is growing They take a three-year average and try to drag back three years ago. That wasn't a good year. Neither one works. A business is worth what it's going to make in the future, right? Right. So that the best indication of that is what it made the past year um, or what it's on track to do the current year. So you have to be careful with averaging and pulling in, especially if you have an anomaly year. Um, if you have like some, I've seen businesses where they they just nailed one amazing government contract or something like that for one year. And it was an anom- anomaly. They didn't repeat it the next year or the following. So bringing that into the future really affects the valuation. Yeah, that's not good. And it, it's not going to work. I mean, you know, so bringing an anomaly in is not going to work. So, yeah. And then our, our last mistake that we see is not having any negative ad backs. So we talk a lot about, about how we add back expenses to increase the SDE of a company, but sometimes you also need to decrease your SDE just to be honest with what's going on with the business and set expectations for the buyer because these things will come out in due diligence. So an example we see is a lot, you know, lost a top customer. So you need to adjust the revenue down, not expecting that revenue to continue in the future. And there's other ones we see too, right, Andy? Yeah, one of the things that we see a lot is uh, not paying market rent, right? So they might have a great lease that's ending next year. And we all know the lease is going up. And, you know, you could argue a little bit that, hey, if the lease goes up, they'll raise their prices, things like that. But, you know, uh, or they own the building and they're not charging themselves enough rent and then they, they want to charge the new buyer a way more rent. Uh, those kind of things happen. You know, basically taking discounts because of bad things. And, and it could be microeconomic things, like something that's happening in, 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 the, uh, in the neighborhood. I mean, maybe there's construction that's going to go on or something like that. Or macroeconomics, like the, the COVID-19 virus that... Uh, is going to put a pause, and maybe that'll be an ad back in the future that, you know, we have a bad year in 2020 and there, we're going to add that back uh, to, we're going to normalize that because 2019 and 2021 are going to be good years. Right. Yeah. And there are, there are reasons to do that, but if you have some negative event or some expense that you've discounted, you need to normalize that for the buyer. 
And look, all of these mistakes, um, we're not trying to like deflate your bubble of your valuation, but they're they're all going to come out in due diligence. And if the buyer doesn't find them, the their advisors will, the bank will find them. Banks really don't like um, messy addbacks a lot with SBA financing. So it'll limit the amount of cash you get down versus having to carry. So the cleaner the recast and the cleaner the valuation you have, the faster the deal moves. And Andy, it's, we've been through lots of deals. We know, you know, deals that get extended for time and more issues come up. It just increases the burnout of both the buyer and seller and the likelihood it's going to fall apart. Yeah. And, and just being realistic with banks. I mean, banks are smart. Banks are going to do their own valuation. They're going to see uh, certain ad backs and they're not going to, they're not going to accept them or adjust for them. And they're, they're going to look at the buyer and they're going to look at the buyer, how they're going to make money in the future. And the other thing that we see a lot of is valuation companies out there that are specifically out to just sell valuations, right? They're, they're charging $50,000. They're charging $25,000 and they're doing all this just to uh, make money on the valuations. And then what will happen is uh, they will make the, the the person who paid for this crazy valuation feel good by giving them a huge number. That'll never come true. So Jessica, that that was a, a great list of items that we uh, have gone over. It's a, a certainly a deeper dive into valuation, which uh, was our goal today. Uh, we have a great interview coming up as well as a listing of the week and deal of the week. Uh, this is a great episode. I'm sure it's going to do well over the years. People are going to uh, play this one time and time again, and uh, we'll use it to help buyers and sellers uh, understand value. So uh, let's get started. Transworld Business Advisors is the world's largest business brokerage and mergers and acquisitions firm with over 500 brokers in nearly 200 offices worldwide. Transworld's team handles thousands of business sales every year. To be connected with a qualified business broker or learn more about the buying and selling process, visit tworld.com forward slash the deal board or call 888-719-9098. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And we are talking valuation again, and it's one of the most favorite subjects. It's certainly something that comes up with every single seller. And I have a very special guest, Paul Corrigan from Transworld Business Advisors of the North Shore in the Boston area. And Paul has an extensive background in valuation, and I'll let him give a little intro. Paul, tell us about your valuation credentials. Oh, thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, yeah, I've been a um, business broker since, uh, I guess, about 2007. And uh, and that's where you get your valuation experience. You kind of learn by the seat of your pants. Uh, what does a business sell for? You talk to other brokers. Um, and I always say business brokers are the best valuators out there. They know how much that pizza uh, shop across the street is going to sell for it. Right. They can't necessarily do what a, what a certified valuator do. And I got my certification in 2016 and actually started my own independent firm, those out evaluations, um, to do that. And I always say the difference is, is I can report, support, and retort on the why the valuation is worth what, what it is, uh, and, and provide people with reasons uh, as to why the, the valuation is what it is and what you can do to improve the value of your business. Yeah, that's great. And 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 there's you have a special thing there as you just put it. You know, we as business brokers have a really good idea of what the marketplace looks like and the certified valuators are looking at, you know, a lot of paper and they're asking a lot of questions. And sometimes there's like a little gap there sometimes between reality and you have, you have that view from both sides. So what are you seeing out there is sometimes the differences between what a certified valuation would say and maybe what something would sell for? Well, I, I think the, the secret is really to look at, look at it from the view of, a, of an independent third party, non-biased buyer. They're only going to look at the, the hard facts, the numbers, and only going to trust what it is they can actually see. Right. So it's very important that you have a great deal of transparency. And this I'm speaking in terms of a seller of, of their business, uh, is to make every sure everything is very clear, the financials are clear, the operation of the business is clear, 
Um, and if there, and, and like I always say, every business, there's always been a few mistakes and there may have been a lawsuit here. There may have been a, an unhappy customer there, but it's not the fact that you had problems. It's how you handled those problems. Mm. And one of the things that, again, a, buy, a buyer's going to look at those things and anything that's not clear, they're okay. going to add a little more uncertainty, a little more risk to that uh, potential transaction. And therefore that's going to reduce the price. And while it may be, you know, to, to a seller or somebody on the inside who knows the business, this isn't a big issue. To an outsider, it, it's a big looming unknown. Yeah, so I think that's a great point that the seller always knows basically all the facts. And, and that's part of the de definition of valuation is having a reasonable knowledge of the relevant facts. And I always say the seller knows all the facts. The buyer knows none of them. So right. every time that there's an inconsistency in the information, the buyer will maybe hugely devalue the business or devalue that portion of the income. And therefore there's some sort of, you know, Delta between what the seller thinks it's worth, or maybe even a certified valuation says it's worth and what a buyer is willing to pay. Well, and, and also, you know, an owner, they've been through the process of starting this business, maybe from scratch or from a, from a smaller scale, they, they brought it up to a certain level. They put a lot of sweat equity into this and a, and a lot of emotion and a lot of care. It's, it's their baby that they've had. So they add a lot of value to that, which sometimes, you know, ignorance is bliss to a, to a buyer. They, they sometimes don't realize how much they're, they're getting into. But an, another factor is, you know, a lot of times a seller uh, gets information from friends, relatives. Uh, my biggest example is always the uh, CPA. And, and they're saying, well, my CPA said the business is worth X. And usually that number is very high. Right. But keep in mind, uh, a CPA may have sort of a conflict of interest. They don't want to lose that client. So they really don't want to see that client sell, sell the business because they may be losing uh, that, uh, that accounting job. Um, so I always say, if they, well, my accountant said my business is worth $3 million. And I usually say, are they willing to put that on, put their name on, put that on paper, sign their name and put their letterhead on top of it? And they usually, they usually aren't. Yeah. So sometimes it's, it's a, a lack of getting, you know, a proper perspective from people that the, that the seller may know and trust. Yeah. I, and I see CPAs and even valuation, uh, experts sometimes overprice a business because they apply big business valuation methodologies to a small little business. Like, and the simplest thing is the CPA tells the seller, well, your business is worth five times and it's, you know, five times what, right. And right. we go through that all the time. Well, and, and, and people may get multiples mixed up. Everybody always wants to know what's the, what's the magic multiple. What's the multiple for my business? And that's sort of like saying, well, the average age in the United States is 37.2. Are you 37.2? Um, that, that multiple doesn't apply. Again, that applies to all businesses, maybe in, in that particular industry, but it's not going to apply to that specific business. If the business is well run, it's very efficient, lean, it's going to have a high multiple. If it's, you know, a tired, older business where Maybe the owner's not putting in a hundred percent effort like he used to. It's it's not going to be worth as much as uh, as the what the average is. Right, right. You know, I always say that those kind of things have an upward and downward pressure on valuation and or the multiple. You know, things like how does it look, or even like some macroeconomic things that are going on right now. I mean, we're going through. Uh, an election year, we're going through a, a little bit of a, a virus scare at this point. And those kind of world events could even, you know, scare buyers even more. No, absolutely. You do kind of need to look at the, a national picture, a, a regional picture, and then obviously in some cases a very, a very local picture. And yeah, it doesn't take much. As you can see, the stock market has been very volatile in the last week or so. Nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. But in, in the long run, you kind of need to sit back and say, you know, are things really going to change that much in the long run? Um, so it is tough to sometimes gain a, a, pers a perspective because when you're valuing a business, you're eventually you're evaluating it into perpetuity. You're, you're imagining that it's going to be there forever. Um, and that's a tough 
um, tough perspective as to what's going to happen next week, as to what will happen one year, five years, or ten years down down the road. Yeah, I you know that's that's the magic of valuation is trying to predict the future. So talking about valuation methodologies or approaches, uh, what's your favorite approach, or what's your you know kind of go to to really get a good feel of what you think a business would sell for? Well, um, especially for small businesses, it's almost always what I call the in- income approach. There are three main approaches, the asset, the income, and the direct data method. And the direct data method is much like real estate comps for, for a house. Mm-hmm. You look at what other houses around your area have sold for, uh, and you can put a, put a comparable to, to your house. You can do the same thing with business, but it's much more difficult. There's much less information available. That information is often spotty. It comes from other business brokers, perhaps from banks who've done transactions. These are known transactions, but the data that they supply to these um, sources that, that let provide that, that information may be spotty at best. We don't know. Mm. As valuators, a lot of times we get that data. We don't know was inventory, inventory included in the transaction. Uh, was there Were there excess uh, operating assets, uh, et cetera? Right. Um, so, so the direct uh, data method is one approach. Uh, the other one is the asset method, which is just basically the the value of the assets in the company. Not usually applicable un- unless you have a very asset heavy industry like the manufacturing. Right. So the most common is is the cash flow method. How much you know? How much cash flow is the business actually generating for the owner, and what is the the multiple of that? What is the what is the return on investment? you need to make as a, as a buyer for the risk that you're taking on. Right. And the stock market does exactly the same thing. But the stock market is a much safer place. They're p- large public companies. Uh, they have me- methodologies and strategies in place to handle all kinds of emergencies. A smaller business, death of the owner, uh, weather-related incidents, uh, economic factors like you, you mentioned, um, can play havoc on, on a much smaller business. So, so usually it's it's um, it's a look at the cash flow and determining the amount of risk. Again, how much risk is there for that cash flow to continue onward into the future? Right, and and so that risk uh, being applied to the multiple or being applied, you know, some businesses are more inherently risky than others, like restaurants, perhaps maybe more risky than something like an alarm uh, service that has recurring revenues. Exactly. Exactly. So you want to look at how much reoccurring revenue is there, how much, how much owner, you know, how much involvement does the owner need to have in their business? One of the one of the first things I like to ask an owner is how long can you be away from your business and still have it run effectively? And if the owner can say, I can go down to Florida for sixty days, and I have my systems and my staff all in place to run the business smoothly, you're ready to sell. But I've oftentimes hear owners say, oh, this place wouldn't run. I couldn't, couldn't make it till next Friday right. without me there. Um, you're not ready to sell because you don't have the systems in place and uh, the training and the resources uh, to, to make a run. So that's one of the key factors I always tell uh, a potential seller is you need to get your systems in place so that the business is ready to move on without you. Because what you're trying to do is have the business run without you. And make money without you. And, and make money with it. Right. So what are, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see or what are the biggest things you see people making in valuation or even in their businesses that, you know, you like to tell them today that, you know, if you had a magic wand that you could fix? Well, prob- probably the biggest one is, is everybody loves to save money on taxes. And there are good ways to save money on taxes, and there are less than good ways to, to save money on taxes. Uh, you, you need to make sure, because again, think about it in terms of a buyer or, or a lender, a bank, right. providing money for, for an acquisition. They're only going to trust what's on a tax return and what, again, what financials are clear, clear and present. So, so the biggest mistake is to not have your books clean and ready and simple, and, and everything's uh, very understandable, very clear as to why the expenses are what they are. Uh, the other thing is what I see the most often is what I call expense creep. And a, and a good example is payroll, payroll expenses. Typically, almost everybody uses a payroll service 
to, uh, to you know, process the payroll for their employees. And every year, most payroll companies will, oh, it's only a couple of pennies per employee per, per payroll period that go on. Well, this goes on year after year. And all of a sudden, I'll see the same company, two companies, each have 10 employees, each are paying them uh, every other week. So same number of payroll transactions per year, but one's paying five times as much as the yeah. other. So it's caught, you know, so how do the cost of goods compare with what the industry is doing? Um, so what I try, so what I do in evaluation is often tell people, here are things you need to look at. Here are ways you may be able to, may be able to increase the value of your business. Um, and it's not really going to cost you. In fact, it'll save you money to, to make this investigation. Yeah. So that's great. All great advice uh, for buyers. And so uh, is there any other parting words you'd like to say before we uh, kind of wrap this up? Well, I always say, um, you know, if, you, if you're even thinking of selling a business, give yourself at least two to three years in advance to, to plan for it, because that gives you time to, to increase the cash flow within in your business and time to prepare for what your exit strategy is going to be. The worst thing is to sort of, hey, I want to sell tomorrow, uh, and I have done nothing to, to prepare for it. And then you're going to run in, you know, you're going to run into all kinds of problems with an owner. You know, a buyer is going to bring up potentially embarrassing or or questions that uh, you, you may not have a clear answer to. Yeah, and it's great you haven't thought about those issues. Yeah, and it's great to talk to someone like Paul or someone at Transworld. Paul, g- give us your contact information so if somebody wanted to get in touch with you to learn more. Uh, well, my my business is Rosetta Valuations. Uh, my phone number is six one seven three two zero four eight one two. Or again, you can reach me at Paul dot Corrigan C O R R I G A N at Rosetta Valuations, all one word with an S dot com. Well, thank you. That's excellent information. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate you coming on today. Andy, I thank you for your time, and, and I'll speak with you in the near future. Hey, Andy, do you know what time it is? It's time for our deal of the week. Deal of the week. Sold. Hey, welcome back, everybody. And it is deal of the week. And we are experiencing, you know, nothing like we've ever seen before, sort of. I mean, we've been through downturns before, but we're still getting deals done. And here's a great example of getting a deal done in a very chaotic time. Michael Shea is with us from Transworld Business advisors of central Florida. And Michael, what's, tell us about this deal. It's certainly interesting. Yeah. So we checked all the box on crazy for this one. So we had coronavirus, we had E2 visa, we had borders being shut down. We had a co-brokering situation. We had the CPA sticking their nose in after the fact, giving opinions, not even the, any of the principal CPA. Uh, we had a sick landlord and then we had, uh, the uh the government shutdown so um the buyer and this this was a oh and we co-brokered it too so we had a another broker's listing um the buyer in this circumstance is a son of a former client of mine who uh you know bought a christmas tree lighting but you know that time i told you about the christmas tree Mm -hmm. lighting business back seven eight years ago in the last one same family right so repeat business coming back young man's 22 and in kazakhstan um there's a mandatory military service, and he was not a fan of that. So he's going to buy a business to not have to drive around a tank in the, in, on the borders of Afghanistan. Um, so got the thing through the immigration pro, uh, portal. Um, coronavirus kicks in, and Trump puts the 60-day uh, or the 60-hour notice that we're shutting down the international travel right when my buyer was coming in. So we were war gaming remote uh, docu signing and positioning changing corporate ownership, but I was able to get the owner booked on a, the buyer booked on a flight through Moscow into Miami, right at the last flight getting into Florida, uh, to make the closing on time. So, um, we did that closing and little side note, we uh, took some of the proceeds. I went down the street to a former client who owned a pizza parlor and we donated Transworld donated a dozen pizzas to the local Florida hospital. And, uh, did some good work for those medical professionals out there and brought some tears to their eyes when we, when we did that. So scratch the restaurant owner, took care of a former client's son and got a, uh, a new client into a new business. Wow. Certainly good deals for good people. Uh, tell us a little bit about the numbers of the business. How big was it? 
Yeah, it was a small one. The company had been around for 40 years, husband and wife team running it. They were doing about $200,000. Oddly enough, it was a printing shop, and their business picked up because mm. they were in Lake County. They they serviced uh, a ton of retirement communities, and the retirement communities were ordering more printing during the coronavirus thing because that's how they communicated with their uh, clients and their tenants. So business was booming uh, because of the virus, oddly enough. Mm. Um and uh, we actually financed forty uh, percent of this, uh, so the buyer got into the deal with sixty thousand dollars down. Great, sounds like a great deal. Well, if somebody yeah, wants, it's fantastic. Yeah, great deal. So if somebody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way? Three two one two eight seven zero three four nine, or email me at mike at pworld.com. Great. Thanks for coming on again today. Thank you. Hey Jessica, you know what time it is? Money time. Almost. It's time for Listing of the Week. Hey, we're back with Listing of the Week. And we do have Michael Ziff of Transworld Business Advisors of London. And he's our master franchisee in the UK. Michael, welcome back. This is an interesting business. I know you've been working with this guy for a while. And it, it's kind of like that typical uh, situation that we have that we walk into a business and they have some work to do. So... This is a guy who's got a leather accessory import business. Um, he's been going for 15 years. Um, he never ran proper books. Uh, I know him very well. I used to do business with him. And um, he came to me and said to me, could we sell his business? Because as soon as we sold his business, he'd like to become a broker for us. Because hmm. actually he thinks this is a great business as well at Transworld. Anyway, um, he and I um, talk a lot together and uh, meet, and I told him he needed to get proper books. And once he had proper books, we would start to get some decent offers for his business. It's um, a great business for somebody who's overseas, wants to come to work in the UK. Um, he's now developed his business well. Um, the year's just finished. will have made £350,000, and he's looking for a purchase price of a million pounds of which he would want £750,000 up front and the balance uh, over a couple of years. And he would stay to help um, to develop the business to the next stage. There are three opportunities as well to buy businesses or bolt-on businesses uh, to, make, to double the size of this business as well, which he would introduce into the opportunity as well. Um, and we believe that if we could bring those businesses together, which we've looked at, we've got a business there that potentially could be making three quarters of a million to a million pounds a year. All right. Sounds like a great business. And we see that a lot, that we could probably bolt a few businesses together. We've seen some buyers do that in the past. And we've also seen where somebody wants, like you said, a million dollars for his business, has horrible books and records. We tell them to finally turn it around. They do. And now, like you said, uh, it's not as an expensive deal. No, it's right. He's gone from making 150 to 350. He's running it very professionally. Doesn't have a lot of staff. There's four of them there, um, but it's run very well. Um, they're importing the product predominantly from China, Pakistan, and India, um, and it's a very, very profitable business. Uh, the opportunity, you know, of growing this rapidly and quickly uh, over the course of the next three years. Great. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you, Michael, what's the best way? Best two numbers to try me are either my email address, which is mziff at tworlduk.com, or my mobile number, which is 0044-7712-867-215. Thank you, Andy. Great. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you like the podcast, share it with your friends on social media. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite podcasting app. If you have questions, would like to appear, or have suggestions for topics for the show, get in contact with us through our website, thedealboardpodcast.com.